So we are looking still at uh, David and uh, reverence for God's way. Uh, we were talking about the early days of David uh, wielding the scepter over all Israel, that he learned a, a lesson on two different occasions about the, about the nature of God. Now, the first lesson, does anybody remember that from, from last week? I know you slept since then, but I just wanted to check. Okie dokie. Uh, so the first lesson uh, that, um, that came up uh, from really the ashes of human tragedy it was uh, the transportation of the Ark of the Covenant. And if you remember, uh, we discussed how Uzzah had reached out his hand to, to steady uh, the Ark because the oxen stumbled and there was an immediate judgment, judgment there. And so, um, you know, David, he had substituted a wagon and oxen for God's specified means of travel, which was to have the, the poles go through, you know, these uh, kind of ringlets on the ark and to be carried uh, on their shoulders. And so in emotion, uh, David viewed God's righteous act as really exceeding the bounds of justice. Uh, it was, he thought, too much. He didn't think that, it, that God was being reasonable. And as Peggy pointed out last week, there in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6, uh, that, uh, that David was afraid. Uh, that he was uh, afraid there uh, of God. And David acknowledged that the failure was his own over in 1 Chronicles 15 and verse 13 saying, we sought him not after the due order or not after due order, meaning that we sought God, David is saying, but we didn't seek God in the way that he wanted to be us to be seeking him. Right? What was that, First Chronicles? First Chronicles 15 and verse 13. There are a lot of people that they seek after God, they try to find God and what have you, but they do it by means that are not <laughs> biblical, and are fed off of emotion. Did you? Yes, sir. Uh, are we in First Samuel or Second Samuel right now? Uh, we're kind of bouncing around, but right now, Second Samuel chapter six. Because I was reading in six last night. What does it mean when it says two cows that had never been yoked? What What is that? I mean, that's that seemed to be important. They got the cart ready with two cows mm -hmm. that have. Never been yoked. Yeah, they hadn't I been yoked to plow a field or, or, or anything well, like they, that. They, they were worked before. But right, basically. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know what was the significance of that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, you, you know, one of the ways people try to search after God today is with New Age, uh, New Ageism. Sorry, New Ageism. <laughs> I was late taking my meds this morning, forgive me. Um, but uh, New Ageism. Uh, many, many years ago, there was a gentleman by the name of Neil Donald Walsh, and he wrote a series of books uh, called, uh, if I remember correctly, there's four in the series, called Conversations with God. Uh, some of y'all, uh, if you were around when it was a big thing, uh, may have heard of it before. Uh, you know, he was unemployed, down on his luck, and, and all of this, and, you know, sitting on a park bench or what have you, and he believes that he encountered God and just started uh, what's called autonomous writing, which was he picked up a pen and just kind of started going and believed whatever he wrote was from God. And it was kind of interesting because in the books you have God contradicting the Word of God. Uh, there's some swearing in there, and and things like that. So he paints a completely different portrait uh, of the biblical God. And many people, are try they try to seek God through that means. Uh, uh, another guy, Eckhart Tolle, uh, wrote a book called The Power of Now and was on Oprah and all of this. And, you know, Oprah's got her own problems. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and people try to find God through, through that and stillness and 
Even Oprah, you know, I mentioned her, but even she said Jesus Christ cannot possibly be the only way. And she was pushed back on it by another woman who said, no, Jesus said he's the only way. And she was like, no, that's your interpretation of what he said. It's like, no, it's, it's right there. It's even in red letters, you know, if, if you want to go with that. So David acknowledged here in 1 Chronicles 15, 13 that we did seek after God, but not the way that he wanted us to seek after him, you know. Um, and that, uh, it, you know, people do that in, in many congregations today in trying to have a more emotive experience by bringing in a lot of music and what have you, uh, right, uh, bands and, and whatnot. And we know just from simple psychology that music, you know, it brings in emotion. It just does. I mean, think about it when you're watching a, a movie or something and there's, you know, if it's a scary movie, then there's those kind of deep tones and deep you know, or, or if you're suspense and it's like Jaws, then dun, 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 dun. you know, or if it's one of those Hallmark movies, there is no sound because I've turned off the TV. Uh, so, so music, so some people will do that. Um, and uh, it, it's, and other things, for example, were in the uh, mid, late 19th century was altar calls. You know, Charles Finney, uh, revivalist, uh, he was a big thing on playing on people's emotions to get them to respond. Billy Graham during his crusades kind of did the, the same thing. And it was, it was like, if you're not going to respond to the gospel based on however long the preacher was preaching, then Finney's reasoning was maybe in these last two or three minutes, you know, I can mention a couple of verses or we can you know, sing a hymn or have, you know, an organ playing or whatever, maybe that'll kind of push you over the edge, right? So not seeking God in the way that God desired to be sought. That, that was the lesson. Now, um, the difference I mentioned last week uh, between the oxen and wagons and the carrying the Ark of the Covenant on the shoulders is, is the difference between obedience and disobedience. That's what it comes down to. You know, God said, do it this way. David and the people chose, well, the people, based on David's command since he was king, the people chose to do it this way. It was a matter of God's will versus David's will. And anytime it comes down to those two wills, well, our will's going to lose. Yes, sir? So, so the issue was how they moved the Ark of the Covenant back. Uh, on a on kind of a surface level, it was in how they moved it, but when we look, because, you know, the way that the ark was built, right, is that on each of the four corners was kind of a, a ringlet, and they were to put, you know, these large posts through there and carry it on their shoulders. And David decided, you know, no, we're going to stick it on the back of a, a wagon, you know, like we're the Beverly Hillbillies, and we're just going, you know, we got gold, black gold, and... Uh, you know, we're just going to carry it that way. So on a yeah, Texas tea. So on a surface level, it is just a matter of how they carried it. Okay. But when we look deeper, it's really about God said, "Do it this way," and David said, "No, we're going to do it this way." Right. And so that. So really, when we look deeper, it's a matter of obedience versus disobedience. Right. David isn't the one to suffer. It was Uzzah. Uzzah, 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 Uzzah. The, that, is, uh, that is true. Well, in a way, uh, yes, uh, Uzzah lost his life. But at the same time, when we consider uh, David, and just think of the weight that it has that a decision you make costs someone else their life. So David did suffer, certainly. And not, and not only that, but also that had to make the other people a little bit fearful of David and his decision making. You know, the last time our king made a decision, this guy over here, he became a crispy critter, right? I'm not trying to end up as the second human chicken tender on the planet, you know? And, and so uh, it depends. Uh, you, I, I guess you'd have to ask, well, define suffering, right? 
so yeah, there was suffering all, all around. Uh, lack of confidence in David, uh, David and the guilt and, and shame of Uzzah, Uzzah obviously losing his life and, and what have you. But that also shows the importance. And, and it's not just there. When we look over, for example, in Leviticus chapter 10 with Nadab and Abihu, and, you know, those are, those are Aaron's sons who, who ate with Aaron, who ate with Moses at, at this kind of banquet feast in the presence of God with all the elders of Israel, and yet they offered strange fire. God strikes them down, and what does God say to Aaron? Don't even mourn your children. Don't even shed a single tear. And we'll talk actually a little bit more about that in, uh, in the sermon next week. So I don't want to say a whole lot. But yeah, it, it's a matter of who it is that is telling us what we need to be doing, how we need to, doing, need to be doing it versus what our desire is. Right? Good, good thoughts and questions. Any other? Yes, ma'am. One thing that in verse 1 of chapter 6, it says there were 30,000 uh, chosen men of Israel there. To me, sometimes we read this without realizing the magnitude of the people that were there. So when God did this thing, it, it was an eyewitness uh, event for those people, you know? Uh, absolutely. Um, we, we look in, I believe it's Romans chapter 9, and we see that uh, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened so that God could be glorified in, in the eyes of all of the people. So, uh, absolutely. Good point. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, so that was the first lesson. The second lesson is on the principle of what we would call divine silence. Divine silence. Uh, David's rule over Israel, it had been firmly established. The nation was at peace. Uh, David, uh, his heart desired to build God a permanent dwelling place. Because up to this point, you know, they only had the tabernacle, which moved as the people. The, the temple in Jerusalem or what have you had not yet been uh, built. And so when David expressed this desire uh, to Nathan, the prophet, he was encouraged. You look in verse uh, chapter 7 and verse 3. Of Second Samuel, he was encouraged to do that. Nathan said to the king, "Go, do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you." So before the, the the rising of the sun, God appeared to Nathan and charged him to return to David and inform him that his initial response was void of any divine authority. Nathan, he had spoken. In the absence of a word from God, he had intruded upon God's divine silence. See, a lot of the times, you know, when when God is silent, people mistake that for God's approval. You know, and, and that was the lesson here. Is you know, when we look, as we've looked up until this point, when there was a, when Moses was leading the people. And they had a question, you know, what do we do? What do we do? What did Moses do? He went to God. He prayed to God. He sought God's counsel in things. And Nathan would do that, uh, and, but then at this, at this one particular time at least, you know, David said, I want to do this for God. I, I want to build a temple. But, Dave, uh, but Nathan, he didn't go and see what God thought about it. He just started speaking, and he said, you go, do what's in your mind, God is, God is with you. But God hadn't said one way or, or, or another. And so then God appears to Nathan, and he said, you need to go to David and tell him that uh, you were wrong. Uh, in verse 5 there of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 Go and say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. 
Wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of, of cedar? And now, therefore, thus, as you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, this is verse 8, I took you from the pasture, uh, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. I've been with you, and I'm, I won't uh, continue reading it on, but the, the idea there is, you know, I have not dwelt in a house at all. I, I've been moving about among the people. And you can even jot down, for example, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, Jesus, he's talking to Nicodemus there, and they're discussing the Holy Spirit. And, you know, Jesus, he's like, it, you know, basically, it's, it's like the wind. You know, it, you don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. You see its effects and what have you. God was not dwe dwelling uh, anywhere. And, and he says there in verse 7, or he asks the question, he's like, did I ever come to you and say, why haven't you built me a house? I mean, if I wanted a house, I could tell you to build me a house, right? Yeah. Uh, I didn't at all. Uh, I, I didn't ask you to do that at all. That's something that you wanted, that you desired. And it's almost similar to the Tower of Babel in the sense that, what was it? The people, they said, let's build us a tower in the heavens and a city so that we can may have a name for ourselves and be like everyone else. Now you look around at the surrounding peoples, the Philistines and all of these other tribes, they all have temples and, and what have you, right? They have all these temples and, and whatnot, uh, and you know, it's almost as though David is saying, I want us to be like everybody else. You know? And God's like, I, I didn't ask you to, to do any of, any of that. And so, again, Nathan, he had spoken in absence from God. He had granted permission for an action that God had not authorized. He had spoken where God had not ordered him to speak. There was no, thus saith the Lord, or, or anything like that. You know, it was just kind of, you do what you want, you know. If you're trying to please God, then it must be okay. You know. Nathan had no right to speak. Uh, David had no right to act uh, where God had not spoken. And God underscores this truth by taking David's mind back to Egypt to the day when... Um, he brought them out of bondage and they marched for freedom there in, uh, in verse 7. That he's walked with them, he, you know, feeding the people, didn't ask to build a house or what have you. And so by divine direction, this divine guidance, David's mind kind of goes back through the corridors of time to Israel's exit from Egypt. Had God commanded Moses to build him a permanent dwelling place? No. Not, not at all. Um, did God say to any of the judges, why haven't you built me a house yet? You know, there were plenty of people before David. Uh, did God uh, charge Saul with building a house? I mean, granted, Saul was... You know, not a great king or anything, but he was the first king, and God could have told him to do it. Remember, he started off okay, you know. He started off praising God, and then went cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but, you know. Um, God did not, did not tell David to, to um, replace the, the house of curtains, the tabernacle, with a permanent structure. God hadn't told anybody to do any of that. And so then uh, as David, he, he's, you know, he's, God has taken him back to when they left Egypt. A and, you know, it's kind of okay. Well, he, yeah, he didn't tell Moses. He didn't tell Saul. He didn't tell Aaron. He didn't, he didn't tell anybody. And, and really, he didn't tell me. This is something that I, I wanted to do. So, um, you know, it... Uh, really was when David looked back to the time 
when the people left Egypt. He really kind of had a Simon and Garfunkel moment in that all he heard was the sound of silence. <laughs> you know, that's all he heard, right? God did not speak and tell him to do anything. Rachel will stay after services this morning to answer questions on how she's able to live with me. Um, the absence of a thou shalt, if you will, or a thus saith the Lord, um, that does not give us a right to do something. Just because God is silent on it, that doesn't mean go ahead and do it. You know, we, we have to look deeper. Um, and, and David, you know, when he when God took his mind back and, and he goes from that time and he goes to his present moment, um, he knew the answer to the question. No, God didn't ever ask, command, or authorize. For, for this to be done. And David's mind, it was really refreshed with one of the most paramount principles of Scripture. And it's really three words. God is sovereign. That's what it comes down to. God is sovereign. It's, it's God's prerogative to speak and our responsibility to listen. Are we always going to understand what God is saying? No. But our job is not to always understand what God is telling us to do. In fact, over in the New Testament, in Romans uh, chapter 9, Now this is it is a different context, mind you. They're they're talking about uh, uh, the elect here and who hears the gospel and, and does it and does not. Um, but there is a question. There is, that Paul writes in chapter 9 and verse 21. Does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? Um, and just before that in verse 8, the, the thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Basically is that we have no right to question God. God is God. We don't have the right to question. And that's part of the problem. Even in religious circles today. Is that we believe in our own ego that we have a right to question what God says is appropriate. If you're raising kids in your house, grandkids, what have you, it's your rules, right? Do you sit there and say, now you can question me on any rules that I set? No, no it's, this is my house. I'm the one that pays the bills. You are dwelling in my house. Go by the rules. If you don't go by the rules, there is some type of punishment. You know? And depending on what that, you know, what rule broke in, it depends on the level of punishment, right? Why would it be any different with God? God says, this world, this universe, the whole of creation is mine. So it's my rules. You don't get to question my rules. You either do what I say, or you don't do what I say. But if you don't do what I say, you're getting a spanking on a cosmic level. You know? And that will not be the sound of silence. That will be the gunshot heard around the world. Okay? What about Moses? Well, when I'm talking questioning here, it, it's, it's more of a, a matter of disobedience. See, in, okay, for example, we can look at, uh, you know, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
You know, are you gonna, if there's a hundred righteous people there, are you going to destroy it? Fifty, are you going to destroy it? So, you know, God's not afraid of those questions. But when it came to David, it wasn't really a question. It was more of a, an acting on my own. I'm assuming, or David, it, assuming really the position of authority over God and saying, this is what I want to do. You know? so, so there is, I mean, it's a fine line. You know, but there, but there is a definite difference there. You know, his intentions were good. He wanted to glorify God by building a special place, but that's not God's desire. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, you know, and, and that's a principle that extends, uh, you know, today. There are people who they may want this in their worship service or that in their this worship service, and and what have you, and they want to do it, and. Their heart might be in the right place. You know, I can't see another person's heart. Their, their heart might be in the right place. But in, at the same time, God says, but that's not the way I want it done. You know? It's kind of funny. There's one, uh, it's not really funny, it's heretical, but there's a congregation. Um, I can't remember the name of it, uh, but uh, they're like, God is first. Um, and yet, their, their pastor is known as the flying pastor. What? The flying pastor, because he comes in with these little hooks on his belt and he flies down to the stage. Oh, God is the focus of our worship service. Uh -huh. Oh, and then but he I comes down. And like, right now. Yeah, one of these days, <laughs> God's gonna break that. <laughs> he's he's gonna break that little chain you, that you that you got holding your britches up. <laughs> um, or it's just gonna be a really bad wedgie. Uh, God. Is the, he possesses the exclusive right to command, to affirm, uh, you know, or approve of, of worship and, and, and give decree. It's man's responsibility to listen, to submit, to, to obey uh, to, that, to that authority. We don't have any right to speak where God has not spoken. You know, there are... There are Moments of conjecture where we can speculate, you know, but we cannot say in, in speculation. For example, on, on Wednesdays, we were just finishing up um, uh, Third John, and so there is some speculation there about the congregation uh, that Gaius was, was a part of. Speculation. But that's different than saying God said this when God didn't actually say that, you know. Um, yeah, to do so, to act where God is not authorized, it, it's presumptuous. It, it's presumptuous, and it's imperative that man has to, to respect both the sound and the silence of God's word. It's not just a matter of where God has spoken, it's also a matter of where God has not spoken. Right? Uh, thoughts or comments? Everybody still awake? Okay. I'm hearing the sound of silence right now. Well, my, my question is, in some of these religious-based fiction novels, mm -hmm. and there's no scripture for something, but is it wrong to read those? To wonder how they may have lived, or wonder how what their names were, or what, you know. Is it wrong? So, I mean, if they're if they are blatantly saying something that's against scripture, then right. they, yeah, ab absolutely, right. You know, um, it. Oh, go ahead. They're not take, They're not taking the. What What is there is there. But history is history. You know, they sure. take that. But they uh, they'll give names to where we don't know, like Jesus' sisters, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, they gave them names. You know, is, is it wrong to wonder and to read? No, well, I mean, it, it's not wrong to, to wonder or, or to read and, and what have you. I, I think the danger, I, I believe that the danger is in adding things that we do not know and so 
they can end up giving a misrepresentation of biblical people from Christ, you know, and what have you. And, and there can be a, a, definite, uh, a definite danger with that because when people uh, have it in their mind, then it can be very difficult to get rid of. I was reading an article the other day um, on, um, on the TV show The Chosen. And there was, there was, uh, it was some guy, and he was talking about prayer, said he really liked the chosen, and he said when he prayed, you know, since he didn't know what Jesus looked like, right, um, he said it helped him to picture Jonathan Rooney, who's the guy who plays Jesus on the chosen, uh, to picture his face, you know, uh, when, when he was praying to Jesus. Okay, a couple of things wrong with that. The first is that we don't pray to Jesus. We pray to God through Jesus. So, so that's kind of the thing. But what really struck is the idea that when he is going to, let's just say he at least got the first part right and he's praying to God, is that he's not thinking about Jesus. He's not thinking about God's word. He's not really even thinking about that. He's thinking about some TV actor, you know. Um, and so, yeah, that, that can be, that's definitely dangerous because it puts it in, it, it puts it in our minds, you know, as to, um, that can distort uh, scripture. Um, yeah, so I mean, each person has to kind of, you know, make their own choice, I, I guess, you know, if they feel that, you know, it's too far for them or it's far enough or yeah, it's kind of one of those, one of those things. It's like James says: if you know to do good but you don't do it, to, to you it's a sin. And so, it's, yeah. Um, nice. Yes, ma'am. I think it's our human nature to try to fill in the blanks. Sure. And there's, as we read the scriptures, we're just not given all those details. Sure. And maybe we just need to uh, make peace with the fact that if we had needed those details, God would have provided them. But it is, um, it's a sort of a struggle because I know we have videos of the children's, of uh, the Bible lessons and events that we teach the children like mm -hmm. out on YouTube, Esther and, you know, they have those videos. And so because we live in this age of technology, those are available to us. Sure. But should the written word be enough? Or, you know, it's, it's uh, something to ponder. It is. Um, I can give my personal opinion. Um, my personal opinion, and it's just my, Mike's personal opinion, take it for what it is. Um, when we look at the history of the Lord's Church, it has grown most uh, during times of persecution. You know, um, when we look at the modern age of technology and what have you, what is it that we see in most congregations? Decline. In the you know, from just going back, let's say to the 1940s and 50s. When uh, preachers had um, the sheet sermons, anybody remember those what? sheet sermons? Uh, a lot of preachers, you know, before you know, because a lot of congregations they didn't even have chalkboards, and so preachers they would have like a white bed sheet that they would have a chart on, and they could fold up twenty of them and stick them in a suitcase, and you got twenty sermons right there. Uh, you know, so even then, you know, the forties, the fifties, and the sixties, the church was growing by great numbers. And, but in this age of technology, it's on the decline, you know, because, I mean, it is a, it is a double-edged sword, sure. There are, you know, because the technology also brings ways for us to evangelize to people, uh, gives us access to more religious materials and uh, be able to help out. Like right now, I think there's people listening on Zoom. So there's be, so you know so people who can't be here you know they have an opportunity to, to be in class and, and, and what have you. But it, I, but it could also work in the opposite direction. 
Yeah, that's why I was saying it's a, just don't want to get up and get dressed. That's true. That's why I was saying it, it's a double-edged sword. Because a lot of people, for example, when COVID started, and, you know, because judges were saying, you know, you can't gather together and all this type of stuff, a lot of people got comfortable and just sitting there and, you know, praising Jesus in their PJs, you know? And so they're like, I don't need to get up and go anywhere anymore, you know? Um, yeah. It's a, it's a thing, you know? And, and realistically, and I'll say this, and then we'll kind of end the class. Uh, when we look at the New Testament church, and when I say when we look at it, forget all the theology books, forget all the doctrinal books, forget all of the pre- and post-Nicene fathers and all of these theological texts and what have you, and we just look at the Bible, right? We don't see social media. We don't see door-knocking campaigns. We don't see Bible tracts. Uh, we don't see Jewel Miller film strips, if anybody remembers those. Uh, we don't see any of that stuff. What we see is 3,000 plus people getting baptized because Christians spoke the word of God. My personal thought is the reason the church is not growing does not have anything to do with technology at all. It's got to do with Christians not being Christian. It's got to do with people just aren't spreading the word of God. People are not doing what God told them to do, go and teach. Yeah, we're, we're too afraid of losing our jobs or offending someone or what have you, and yet we look in the New Testament and it's kind of, okay, what is it, Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than man. You know, it's people in jail, people getting killed, and all of this for the sake of the gospel. And, and we don't even like to, to be uncomfortable. You know? Good thoughts, comments. Sorry I got on a soapbox there for a little bit, but you know, still stand by what I said. Uh, any, uh, any closing thoughts or comments?